Hello and welcome to another episode of Webflow and Code where I teach you the underlying code you're writing in Webflow. Today is going to be a big one. Today we are going to be looking at the input type attribute. I don't know why I said it like that. Uh, input type attribute, which has a massive array of different types of input elements that we can achieve just using the one element. Yes, of course, it's using custom code. It's something we don't get as a as an, a component within Webflow. So we're going to be writing a little bit of code, but I'm going to be taking you through all the different types and kind of how we can use them, different ways we can use them. If it gets too long and if it gets too boring, then I might split it up into two different sections. But let's see how we get on and enjoy this week's episode of Webflow and Code. So right off the bat, I want to just point your attention to the uh, Mozilla documentation for different types of elements. And this is primarily where I'm getting my information from to kind of learn what these input elements are capable of. And I, I want to point you to this because just know that the information is very easy to find. And I'll kind of want to take you through the different areas of the documentation that I'm looking at. And then I can go through the documentation and kind of understand a little bit about it. You know, you can understand what the markup is I'm just reading a quick description of what it does um, and then I'm scrolling down um, to see this little table here which actually tells me what the value sort of format is supposed to be and the importance of this is really a distinction that with the input type with browsers that don't support this actual you know this specific type uh, that can't render it or whatever it actually degrades gracefully into a, just a normal text input so if you you know if you're building a website for ie6 or something like that and it doesn't support the month type month or whatever then the user will still be able to insert a text value for that for that element so this, this is quite important to know and this is what you would this is also what you'd receive on the back end if, if the user clicks on the date clicks on a date this is the sort of format you'd expect to receive on the on the back end. So that's kind of the first one I'm looking at. Second one I'm looking at is events. So we looked at conditional forms elements on one of our previous episodes and we were able to respond to different types of events. Now, not all events are registered by all input types. So here we can listen to the event change or input and that will actually fire when someone changes the element here and we can listen out for these and then respond to them. So it's worth looking at what events that they're, um, that these input elements can respond to. And, and I think generally they always are change and input, but just worth noting. Another thing worth noting is the supported common attributes. Now we've got a lesson on attributes, so look out for that one and subscribe if you haven't already so you can uh, keep up to date with everything that's going on. But these are also uh, common attributes that are used on this particular element. And then the other one I'm looking at is methods here. So this could actually be, you know, if you have some JavaScript, you have a button or something like that uh, that triggers some JavaScript, what you can do to this input type. So you can have a button that makes it step down or step up or whatever. So this is another one I'm, I'm sort of interested in. And then I kind of just skim through and just see if there are any kind of call out things and we'll get into um, call out kind of things as we go through all the different types of inputs and, and kind of gotchas, I guess. But like I say, I just wanted to show you the documentation so you're not kind of on your own and you can go out and do this research yourself without having to kind of sit through um, these types of videos or if you get lost, you can dip into the documentation and not be overwhelmed by the documentation. You kind of know where you're looking and what sort of things you're looking out for in order to solve your problems. So with all that out the way, let's get into input types, okay? The changing an input type, um, as I say, a lot of them degrade to text fields and a lot of them are basically text fields. They just give you a sort of UI that you can write text to that field. So if we take our date, for example, it just gives us a UI to essentially create a piece of text that writes that. So really we're looking at these for extra help when it comes to validating. So if a user does type this out manually, they don't use the UI or the browser doesn't give them a UI because that's another thing to take into account here that not all browsers will render the UI the same. Um, we can fire up a, a warning or an error if they haven't formatted it correctly. So really, these are just a way to help with, with that kind of validation aspect. So let's jump 
into the different types of input elements, right? And we're gonna we're not gonna spend an awful lot of time in code. I think it be, it's best that we work through the documentation. So once again, you're kind of not overwhelmed. If we need to dip dip into Webflow, then we should do so. So first up, we have input type button, okay? And this is kind of the markup here. We've got an input, and then we've got the actual type. Uh, of button and this is this is all we're going to be working within today is the only thing we're really going to be changing and all this essentially does is give us a value it's similar to the webflow native um, input type submit really we can um, it's all formatted exactly the same way but if we read the description here elements of type button are rendered as simple push buttons which can be programmed to control custom functionality anywhere on the web page as required when assigning an event handler function. What that basically means is if we've got some JavaScript listening for click events on this button, then really it's just a way of letting the browser know that this is a something that will cause something else to happen. Uh, it's, it's not really useful in the form of um, submitting data to a form. So it's we wouldn't use this to actually collect data from the user. It's just simply there to maybe hide or show something or create an accordion or something like that. So it's worth just noting. Once again, scrolling down, um, clicking of click events, common attributes of type. It's a real simple element. There's nothing much really more to say about it, right? The second one we have, which is a very interesting one, is of type color. So you can actually collect color information from from a user inside of a form. And this again is what the, the, the markup looks like. It's of type color and it expects a, a hexadecimal value as the value. And that's what will again get submitted to the back end of the website. And this is kind of how it renders. So I'm I'm using uh, I'm using Edge right now, which is very similar to Chrome. But here you can see the UI and I'm able to select different colors and various things like that. You don't have to have a default value here. You can actually set that as empty and you can see that it's defaulted there to black. And then when the user comes and selects that way, that's when the value will actually change on here. So you don't have to set a default value. As with most of these things, you don't have to set a default value. It's when the user interacts with it, it's the case. Once again, a very simple element, but interesting to know that we have access for the user to select a color and submit that as part of a form. So here we have the date, which we went over briefly in the introduction. So a date element is quite literally an input type of date and it renders a little UI for the user to actually select a date with a sort of month and a year sort of thing. Once again, the, you, can, you can set a default value. Uh, if you leave that empty, the default value would be today, or at least when they open this UI, the default value would be today. It's then up to them to select that. Scrolling down and looking at our uh, summary here, you can see that the, the value needs to be in this value if the user was to type it out. Um, Obviously the events are input and change, so no surprise there. And you can see here we have a minimum and a maximum value to the date. So this will this will prevent the user from actually selecting any dates, obviously before or after those um, those dates, which is really handy if you kind of need that functionality. I think for a lot of these date time elements, we have to be mindful that this is not a format in which a user would typically write in they would they would write it in a slight different way you can even see in the ui here it's going date month year it's it's strongly recommended and this will become even more clearer in in some of the following elements it it's probably important to give a user three separate fields for the date the month and the year and then combine those or um, submit those as three separate values in in the back end just because it's too easy for this to get confused and the user might get stuck or if, or if their browser doesn't render the UI they haven't got an easy way to type those things out date is a fairly uh, well supported element but as we grow as we get into some of these other ones they're not as well supported and it's probably better again just to provide select fields with um, numbers of the dates and times and years and various things like that leading us nicely onto the date time local so again input type date time local and you can see here the value is kind of this date with the year starting and then it was at the letter t 
and then the time, okay? So this is where you start to see it getting a lot more complex, a lot more complicated, and where the user could potentially trip up. So it's probably not advised to use these types of elements um, unless you're absolutely sure that the user will use the UI, which I'm not too sure how you would do that. But it's, again, probably better. Again, you can see the different types of renderings here. This is Edge. It's, it's probably better to provide different select values or, or whatever you need uh, or whatever you think is more appropriate to show the user to be able to input those values separately. I think that goes without saying with input type month, but quickly just looking through it of type month, you've got again those min max values if you want to use them. Uh, but a, a month simply takes the year and the month and then the UI obviously just selects the whole month as opposed to kind of a single date. And the same with the time, which I think is a bit more logical because it's just with a colon. But again, you might just want to simplify it for, for your user to be able to provide a time um, if 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 you're encountering issues or people users are encountering issues when inputting a time so there you go that's the end of the first part i hope you enjoyed it the stuff at the beginning of this episode was actually really crucial so i'll probably re reference that in the second episode but if you like this episode then please give it a thumbs up and if you want to see more including next week's episode then please make sure you subscribe and hit the bell notification until next time happy no coding